Hello, hope you're well. Ben here, and welcome to episode 22 of Benji's Cafe podcast. Joining me for a coffee this week in Benji's Cafe is the actor Diane Pilkington. Diane trained at Guildford School of Acting and is now one of the country's leading theatre stars. Her West End credits include Glinda in Wicked, Donna in the smash hit ABBA musical Mamma Mia, and Elizabeth in Mel Brooks's hit Frankenstein. Diane features in the Les Miserables movie directed by Tom Hooper and most recently played Jenny in the ITV soap Emmerdale. In this episode, we discuss Diane's career, the importance of theatre groups in creating confidence for children, plus Diane's approach to auditions and the thrill of getting a role. And that's that level of becoming invested in something yeah. is what makes it wonderful when you get the part and utterly heartbreaking when you don't. Because oh, yeah. you've really, really poured your heart into it. And it's no one's fault. It's just, you know, somebody else was more right for it. But yeah. I think I think allowing yourself 24 hours is really healthy. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're not acknowledging all that time you put in. Yeah. And all that like, the investment. Yeah, and, yeah. And belief. I remember when I got Glinda, I was on the bus in Moswell Hill. Wait. <laughs> It was packed, standing up, <laughs> holding on to like a thing. Like, <laughs> it was really surreal. Diane is super talented and super nice. Pop the kettle on and enjoy listening. Welcome to Benji's Cafe Podcast, Diane Pilkington. Good morning, <laughs> Diane. How are good you? Good morning. I'm good. How are you? Really well, thank you. Hey, I <laughs> like that little um that little tease of the mug there. Little mug. Having a nice. cheeky little coffee. Yeah, I mean, without doing too much product placement, my friends make coffee and it's got adaptogenic mushrooms so you don't crash during the day. It's oh my delightful. God. That sounds great. This is good and it's quite strong, so I land myself one of these, otherwise I'll be bouncing off the walls. It's so <laughs> nice to see you. Um, I know it's crazy, isn't it? It's been so long, but I know you're from Wigan. Just want to say, I went out with a girl years ago. This is going back. A l- I'm old now, Diane, so it's a long time. I used to go to Wigan every Sunday for about oh six months. And honestly, it was like every Sunday I was in Ibiza. And I think I saw the best <laughs> Phil Collins sound alike in Chicago Rock Cafe ever. Mm. It was amazing. Was it? Oh was my it a, God. Was it a fun place to grow up for you? You know like- what? It was. And we had quite, a, you know, quite a mad place. There was the Pier nightclub. And, you know, and we, had, we lay claim to the Verve. Love the Verve. So wow. I, I sort of, you know, it was I was a teenager in the late 80s, early 90s. Growing up with all this kind of grungy stuff going around, I was really... I mean, I'm quite pale and I've got dark hair, so I didn't need to try that hard. <laughs> I was quite gothy as well for a while. And so we used to, Yeah, we we had it all on our doorstep. And there's such a, there is such a nice vibe to Wigan. There's something about it. And it's really into its arts and culture and always has been, which is quite interesting now that Lisa Nandy is the arts and culture secretary um, because she obviously no stuff from what she's been saying it's always been a place it's always been a center where they've pushed arts and pushed music and stuff like that which is probably why i ended up going to drama college because i didn't actually think acting was a job i didn't know that so um it's yeah it was fun but as you say karaoke there's a lot of karaoke there there was one summer before i went to drama college where we kind of put ourselves through nights out by going to karaoke's and rotating and, you know, winning beers for the night. (laughs) (laughs) And what was your go-to, Dan? Did you have a go-to bit of Celine, maybe? I I was actually Sinead O'Connor. I was nothing compared to you. Oh, nice. Slash Prince. But, uh, yeah, that was my... Mine was that and sometimes a bit of fairground attraction. We had a great time. Oh, and, I love um, it. and obviously, you know, Liverpool and Manchester were, were both nearby, but they were quite, you know, they were quite intimidating. So yeah. Wigan was, was a cool place where there was plenty to do and plenty of nightclubs and stuff like that. I think I was the world's tallest Jimmy Somerville. So I used to give it, <laughs> is it the only way is up? I think confused quite a lot of pub goers. You mentioned the, the massive music scene there, but musical theatre how did how did that come about did was it at school i'm not school quite or was, sure was it like a local theatre group for you 
Um, yeah, it was actually in Southport. Uh, we went. To, we had a really brilliant drama group, Wigan Little Theatre. I should give a shout out yeah. to Wigan Little Theatre. And then I went to school near Southport, and quite a lot of people went to a place called Merry Go Round, which I don't think happens anymore because um, it was some time ago. Loads of us. There's loads of West End people that went to Merry Go Round. Bex, who's currently Lauren and Kathy and Stella, she was a Merry Go Round girl, and I think she. Was she married around a Southport Dramatic Society? There was rivalry there. But in my year at college at Guildford, there were four of us from wow. that from that drama group. And so I was really lucky because I didn't really... I don't come from a theatrical background at all. My parents didn't know about things like the National Youth Music Theatre or anything like that. They just... They weren't part of that world. There wasn't... The, you know, the, the internet wasn't there to let people know about things. So I was just really fortunate. And I went there because I was really shy because, and I don't think that's for the perspective. I don't think, I think it was there as a function to be like, you know, let's, let's get Diane to come out of herself a little bit. It's just yeah, like, oh no, yeah. bring her back in, bring her back in. So <laughs> <laughs> what about you? How did you get into it? Gosh, well, at school, I think my, my first part at school was like, I was a corpse and I what lovely war in like my third year. And then somehow they asked me to like audition for the National Youth Theatre. Oh, so, so I, you did do the National yeah, Youth Theatre? Yeah, I did that. But likewise, yeah. you know, I had no history. I, like, my grand bless and my mum were in the local Amdram. My, my mum was particularly good in the Deep Blue Sea. I think it's oh. Terence Rattigan or Terence Rattigan or Terry Wogan wrote that. I can't remember. <laughs> but yeah, but likewise, like, interestingly, I was going to ask you, because has it helped you, do you think, not having anybody connected to the business and, you know, your friends from home? Because all of my friends have got nothing to do with the business. It's kind of grounded me and kept me sort of rooted and yeah. real, if that makes sense. I I think so. I mean, the funny one, I, I think I st- when I started out, I was, I, d- I wished that I'd got you know, a little bit of guidance yeah. into into it. But to be honest, I didn't have a terrifically tough introduction. I was very lucky. Things fell into place quite quickly. It was a very natural career for me. You know, things just happened seemingly in the right order. Nothing too quick, nothing too slow. So I can't really complain. Yes, I do have friends from home who who don't do it, and I've stayed in touch with them. So yes, you stay in touch with with real life, yeah. if you like. But also, I think it um, it made me not take anything for granted, and it also made me really want it. Yeah. So there was no question there being any kind of pushing. Certainly not any pushing. You know, my parents were so supportive, but they definitely did not push me into this industry. And they're very bemused by it. So I think because it was my choice all along, I've always felt ownership over it. Yeah. yeah. But I feel quite strongly that there was never a moment where I felt like I'd been funneled in one direction because that definitely wasn't true. So I'm trying to do the same with my son, actually, because obviously, you know, I, I know people, I know where to send him. I've got I've got the information and the tools if he wanted to do it, and he does quite like theatre groups now. But I I really made him make the choice himself. I didn't introduce him to anything because just one if he wants it, he got to want to do it. And I think um, it's it's a tough industry, and if the real love isn't there for it, then it's just what's the point. Yeah. Oh my God. You've got to love it, haven't you? My you have goodness. To. But it's so lovely that you you, you know you realise that you can be there for your son to support and could you yeah. just 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 to be there you no know, when he decides what route he doesn't want to take ready to pounce yeah well, my darling <laughs> let me tell you he, I mean he's into all kinds of things he's mostly into computers but he really loves his drama group and it's given him so much confidence outside of school and I think there's something that I feel quite strongly about with with theatre groups and grassroots theatre groups I think um they are such a wonderful place to go if you perhaps don't fit into a nice yeah. neat little box of what kids are doing right now. And um, I certainly didn't. And she goes quite similar to me. It's a wonderfully inclusive, uh, can be, and it should be a wonderfully inclusive space where you can just go and be yourself and be as, for want of a better word, I was a weird kid. So, you know, I could just go and be weird with a bunch of people who were also being weird. It's great. This is lovely. And then I was like, oh, oh, I'm just creative. Oh, I see. I get it. Right. Yeah. Okay. And it was a place where I immediately felt at home. But there were loads of people there who don't do it for a living. You know, it was just a place to go 
to that side of yourself and who also it's brilliant for confidence building it's brilliant to take into real life talking in front of people that you work with it's yeah. really intimidating it gives you the confidence to do things like that so yeah i'm passionate about grassroots theater companies yeah completely I'm, I'm, I, it's like such a, a good safe place isn't it to yeah. to be yourself to learn about yourself and just give you those confidence skills and people skills that whatever walk of life you do end up going into they just really help, don't they? Exactly. And, and, and learning also, how to be part of a group that yeah. are supportive because I think everything is so competitive. And weirdly, the least competitive space I've ever found is in a good theatre company or a good theatre group because it's all about the whole, not about one person doing better than everybody else and beating them. You know what I mean? Yeah, Which yeah. Kind of, that's, that's not the narrative that's peddled out, is it? We're all supposed to be like... <laughs> in beads off each other's necks and throwing them down the stairs like a show girls. and it's not like I that I know it's not, it's not at like all that. and when you when you realize that and you have that first experience earlier in your career it's just you think that it can't get better than this it's just such a lovely feeling did yeah. you have did you have that feeling when you went straight into the company of Les Mis after graduating Diane or, or was, was that I? an opener working That's... with more experienced people was it quite tricky it to was, navigate you know what it was it was interesting because I was very immature I think that um, what I would say about a drama college is by the time you get to third year, you are properly into yourself. You've gone through your training, your third years now, and you're doing all the shows and everyone comes to see the shows. And if you have a lead yeah. part in that show, that's when people start getting a little bit of an attitude and an ego. So right. I probably, I think we probably all had a bit of that when we came out, you know. We graduated and got a job and gone into got an agent and gone into Les Mis. So I was probably a right brat, and I'm sure I was. I just think it's a natural thing. But I've always had an awful lot of respect for performers who've been who've been doing it longer than me. And I was lucky enough. The cast of Les Mis when I went into it were very very um, varied in age mm. and experience. There were quite a lot of us, and even then, the, the older members of the company, who I can say now because I'm generally one of those, were like, oh, everyone's so young nowadays. Everyone's oh. so young nowadays. You know, all these kids coming out of drama college. But they were nice, but we were those kids, and we felt terribly grown up. And th those probably maybe about six, that's all. But there were older performers there. You know, they were all of 26. But yeah. there, there were some slightly, I think they were bringing up to probably about 40, which I'm not sure is the, the norm now and it all seems really young but now i'm doing that thing i'm just going oh they're all so young there were there were plenty of people particularly in the ensemble who were experienced and have been doing it for a really really long time were excellent guides because the things that you don't learn at drama college are just really simple things like tipping your dresser at the end of the week as uh, you know I, yeah. and luckily someone came to me and just went by the way before there was any issue um, it's not like I'd forgotten or anything. Before the end of the person came to me, when we do, we do a thing where you tip the dresser at the end of the week, it's about this kind of money. It's just like a little courtesy thing. No one told me that when I left drama college. And I want to tell you now so that you don't find yourself going a couple of weeks and then going, everyone yeah, hates me. So, yeah. Um, yeah, just little courtesy things, little ways to behave. It it was a safe space to learn and that I, I'm very, very fond and still in touch with of and still in touch with most of the people that I did that, that probably all of them with what was your first show gosh my first show was it was a play no my first show I did the Scottish play so it was oh, a play fancy. it's nuts isn't it because I'm not superstitious but I still can't bring myself to say it so the Scottish no. play but Diane it was awful it must have <laughs> No. Oh, yes, that was my... F I've got two, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you both. <laughs> okay, um, go So the first one I did, the Scottish Play, I was playing Malcolm in that, and we, it was at the York Museum Gardens outside, and it was like a six-week summer season. We were paid Ooh. peanuts. We were changing behind bushes, and I think that was for the show. It might just have been after the show, I'm not sure. But, yeah, so we were outside <laughs> performing, and literally, Diane, we'd be performing to three american tourists and a dog and i think yeah at one point i have to I have a sword fight and i'm supposed to be on the floor bleeding and, and i was just there chuckling it, honestly it was like <laughs> this is not good we've all and, done those yeah and then it didn't get much better my second job i played the king of copenhagen in a school's tour so bear in mind that i'm six foot six i was there dressed with a fake belly my white tights and an orange king's costume with a crown on and there were three of us in the show and we we did different areas each week diane and this particular week we we're in Froome, 
so Dorset. I, I know Froom. Oh, do you? I did a, a concert there for some random thing. Yeah, oh my there God. you go. Well, I hope you didn't see my King of Copenhagen. It was hardly award winning. <laughs> but the the night before, we'd been to, uh, in my drinking days. We we went to the other guy in the show, lovely chap. And um, we went to his local, and he was like, oh, "We'll have a few pints of the local stuff." So we had a few pints of Scrumpy. And Diane, the next morning, I felt absolutely dreadful. It was a Monday morning and there were sort of 300 school kids. I'm there hungover, dressed as the King of Copenhagen. And literally, I was just about to say, morning kids. And I just had to run to the staff toilets and I was chucking my guts up dressed as the King of Copenhagen. I was like, whoa, 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 this is not good. But you know but, what? Yeah. All those experiences made me completely embrace and cherish when the bigger jobs came. Absolutely. And like you say, you learn etiquette, you learn how to behave, you learn how to treat people. But I think ultimately it just made me so appreciative of when the bigger jobs came and the bigger theatres. I totally agree. I totally agree. Obviously, I went into quite a big machine first yeah. off. But then my next job was at the Brideswell. I think I've got sixty pounds a week. Yeah, sixty it's crazy, quid a week. It? Yeah, for doing Sondheim. Oh. <laughs> you you pay to do Sondheim, don't you? I loved yeah. it. And actually, again, it was such a wonderful experience, but for completely different reasons and all the different things that you learn. Yeah, I actually have met some lovely people along the way, including yourself, obviously. <laughs> but it's just like. I think about it. And I think, yeah, there's some some lovely people. There's that one hand the people who work with that. I'd be like, ah, oh, yeah, ooh. a little bit skew if. Yeah, because generally people are nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, no. I first met you. You were doing the beautiful game at the Cambridge, Diane, and um, I was hearing that in my head as really? I was getting ready today, and I think oh, it's because I put green on. <laughs> ah, but what a show! And like oh, in contrast to Les Mis, where you're joining, you know, a well, well-oiled machine. That was yeah. a new show, Ben Elton, Lloyd Webber. What were the contrasts in rehearsing for that? Was the was the material ready for you and? Like, did you have mm. any input, much input? I mean, the show, I loved the show. The school was brilliant. But that rehearsal process, that must have been extremely different. Yes, it was. It was. It was really interesting because it was a very different type of Andrew Lloyd Webber show. And it was so exciting doing a new Andrew Lloyd Webber show. Oh, my God, living the dream. And I had just done that thing at the Bridewell, so I was actually being paid enough to live as well, yeah. which was great. I mean, that at that point, actually, really early on, on in my career, it was very much like if they paid me enough to actually live off, I'd be like, I cannot believe this this bonus that I'm getting in my paper. Yeah. <laughs> and looking back, it was quite not very much. But it was wonderful. And I only had a tiny bit to do, really. I was the Protestant girl. The, uh, yeah. the you know, the balance against yeah. Josie Walker in a song. And so I felt really excited because I had my own little bit to sing. Um, and that stayed the same. So that bit was always part of the show that I think they felt worked. So that, that didn't really move. Right. Um, the There was a lot of it that was really, really chopped and changed, which was, again, a really good insight because I wasn't, I didn't have a big enough role that I felt ownership over it I could observe from a distance which was good because I then went on to do Taboo which was a much bigger role and my goodness talk about chopping and changing I was like really? what, what, what am I playing today oh my boyfriend's dead now is he right okay and oh do I gosh. I've got a baby I've not got a baby I've not got a baby tonight so we've been rehearsing during the day so it can be like that on new musicals especially there's multiple creatives who've all got a slightly different idea of what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. And I wouldn't say Beautiful Game was like that. I think that people people had a similar vision, but it does it lead to lots of changes. And then, so you mentioned the changes in Taboo. Were they daily? Were you get like, how, how, how long so, would you have to digest like a script change? That must luckily, have been so tough. You know what? There's something that I, I thank my lucky stars for, and I've only realised in later years that it isn't norm. One thing I do have, I'm really quick at learning things, and I only know that because of then spending time with other, you know, other loved ones, helping them learn things. And I'm like, what? Why? You don't yeah. know? And it's yeah. like, oh, okay. So it's actually, so I'm very lucky. My brain works really quickly in that way. And I retain information and then forget it quite easily as well. So yeah. they went through a period of time just after we'd opened when we were in previews. 
where chunks, swathes of the script would change. And not just the script, the story. A, juve, a young juve love story in the middle of all this fabulousness. And the fabulousness all worked brilliantly from the outset because it was just fabulous. Then essentially a typical juve lead love story in the middle of it. And it's difficult to tell that story. In in a scenario like that, when everyone's just going, just bring on the people with the cool wigs. What do they do? Why are they singing a love song? Get and, the wigs um, on. Yeah, you know, and it was all a bit. Bring back the bloke with the makeup. It's brilliant. And so I think think that there was they were just trying to make that work because it needed it as a through line because it was the fabulous Luke Evans who was playing my boyfriend, and um, and he. A lot of it together, bringing in the Boy George element, bringing in the Lee Bowery element, and he'd got this girlfriend, so who was quite moody and really gothy. They were just weren't quite sure on my, what my story was going to be or what his story was going to be. So I would honestly be coming in, and it'd be like, right, so the first third of the script has changed, and we're going to try and put it tonight. But then I'd be like, well, what what happens? But, you know, you get through it, yeah, and it was fun, and it was a huge learning curve yeah, in I'm every surprised. sense of the word. Uh, <laughs> loved every minute of, of Taboo. It was absolutely crackers, absolutely yeah. crackers from beginning to end, and never felt simultaneously more insecure and more empowered. It was the yeah. weirdest thing. Because I felt like we we were telling something, we were doing something quite exciting. Yeah, and it was wonderful to be part of that. It was really new. But at the same time, I felt terribly insecure because I'm just like, why is, why is everything changing all the time? Why is that rubbish? <laughs> and now, with experience and hindsight, I, I've done quite a few workshops. I love doing a workshop. And that, as an actor, is a real gift because you see why things change and why, why, why things are cut. And it's yeah. very rarely to do they think you're rubbish. It's to do with the arc of the show, with the structure of the show. And to do with the time of the show, yeah, you know, yeah. sometimes you've got to, you've got to cut loose some of your babies. And always, I think, especially in form, you think it's because you're rubbish. I have yeah. massive imposter syndrome, so immediately I'd be like, they've cut my song because they think I'm crap. Yeah. But actually, and maybe I was, but actually, it's generally to do with something completely different than that, and it's got nothing to do with you. Yeah. So I, I and- recommend workshops if you can do them yeah and a decision yeah. can be made that's completely out of your control and like you say through experience yeah. you just learn to take deep breath okay it's nothing to do with me it's for the yeah. good of the show and you know we move on we learn from that yeah exactly Dan, i saw you as glinda in wicked i think it must have been oh. into your second year my god you were good <laughs> you were so good oh um, thank you i loved it so much i loved it you were fantastic and your vocal was so clear it was spot on Uh i just want to ask you your technique is obviously rock solid but like the pressures of playing all these parts that you have and do donna in mamma mia it's vocally demanding how do you get through an eight show week is it obviously a solid technique but do you have little tricks you know is it just sleep hydration because you know you did three years in wicked and I can imagine your vocal at the end was as good, if not better, as when you started. And by the end, I didn't have a top C. I will say that. Really? I'm not really a soprano. I mean, listen to the way that I speak. I'm so... Yeah. I've got the notes, but it's not where my voice sits. So I, that was a challenge for me. to, it, And it always is if I'm casting anything that goes above maybe an A or a B, because it's a little bit high for me. And that's always going to be when I'm tired. That'll be the bit that goes. I'm a really, I'm super lazy. I'm really, really, really lazy. I had a fantastic singing teacher growing up from um, being about 14 to when I went to drama college. I was really lucky. Again, I've, I've just been so lucky. There was yeah. um, a, a wonderful opera singer who um, settled down the corner from where my parents lived she had a lot of caregiving responsibilities and so occasionally went off and did things but sort of took a step back from her career and taught local kids piano and singing so I went to her for piano and these stupid hands can play piano I can't even make an octave uh, and she very very nicely suggested that she might she said I feel like I might be able to train your voice because I can hear that you can sing when you do your oral tests as opposed to train those silly banana fingers. So 
And she was very kind about it. So I went to her, and I think I was the bane of my life because I don't, I've always been really specific about, I know how to, I want to sing that, and I'm quite resistant. I'm not anymore, but I ha- I can be quite resistant if I think, certainly when I was a teenager. But, but despite me, she managed to instill some technique into me, despite my best efforts to be a teenager. And so I think I went to college with a good vocal technique. And then I had a great teacher while I was there. Um, then I left college and I um, had about three singing lessons since I left college. because. <laughs> Oh my! It's awful. But then I've also, in my defence, I've worked with some fantastic MDs. Yeah. And I think that they certainly. I mean, I'm going to say my name of my friend David White, who I've worked with as an MD, is somebody that would give me vocal technique tips that were so specific to the job that I was doing, and so specific to me as a person once he got used to all my little cheats that I was doing. And I feel like half of that is stuff that you you get from an MD that I'm really not making a case for my laziness here, am I? I should go and see a singing teacher. And I have on occasion when it's going to be something that is a bit of a stretch, isn't in my normal comfort zone. But I think when I was at college, I decided that I wanted to sing in a different way than I'd been taught. I wanted to sing in a less classical way. Um, yeah. So I I got, again, I just listened to the people I wanted to sound like and tried to emulate the sound. Uh, As I've got older and you're, you're, you know, everything's less elastic. I just think yeah. I've started. It's like skincare. It's all of that. It's like going for, it's like actual exercise. You suddenly go, oh, Genetics aren't just going to cut it anymore, are they? I think I'm going to have to take this seriously. <laughs> so I do hydrate, really big hydration. Um, when I was doing She Loves Me, MD there, again, most of my life is MDs helping me out and go, have you considered that maybe you drink too much coffee, Diane? Right. Um, okay. Because, again, it was quite a high thing. And he said, I've watched you in rehearsals. You don't stop drinking coffee, and then you wonder why by the afternoon your voice is really dry. It's because you're dehydrated. Stop drinking coffee all the way through rehearsals. Okay. So I did, and it was he was right. So I I tried very hard not to drink coffee after midday. I drink a lot of water now, and I I've got one of those nebulizers. All right, yeah. That yeah. I laughed at when everyone got them and went eh, whatever. <laughs> And I was really, and I really struggled on tour because it's hard work, weekly touring, doing bed knobs. And one of the boys, one of the younger cast, mm. said, "Please try my nebulizer. I think it will help you." And he was right. It's really good. Oh, that's good. You know, good. like saline stuff. It yeah, really just yeah. it helps so much. So if I'm feeling, if I'm feeling really vocally tired and I can't take a day's rest. Because really, it's rest and hydration. Yeah. That's what it is. But we know that there are times that you cannot get that. You can't get the rest. You can do the hydration, but you've got to go to rehearsals. You've got to do a show in the evening. And that's, yeah, the nebulizer gets you through those little sticky periods. Yeah. And, so, Donna, and, and Donna and Mama Mia, Diane, that's a very yeah, different kind right. of vocal, isn't it? Yeah, to be honest, I found that sat somewhere in my voice that was very safe. So that, and people say that, and I know that, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not dismissing that it is a big thing because I know that it is. Mm. And in the same way that, you know, I find a soprano role, a tough thing and, a, and an actual soprano would be like as easy as anything. Do you know what I mean? It's really simple. I find that in the middle of that, that particular range was okay for me. It didn't really have any, anything there that felt like it was wear and tear, which is probably why I could do three years. Whereas yeah. I, I, yeah, Glinda, I, by the, like I say, by the end of the third year, I was really struggling to get that top two. Just because that's not, that's not really what I do. I do high, <laughs> no- high notes for jokes. That's what I do. <laughs> and when, when the offer comes in for Glinda or, you know, for Donna. Oh my God. You know, in, like, yeah. is it that feeling, is it as exciting as it's always been for you, that yeah. moment when you get the call, you've worked so hard. That's 
that level of becoming invested in something yeah. is what makes it wonderful when you get the part, heartbreaking when you don't. Because it's, I think it's impossible for me anyway, as a person, it's impossible for me to do, the, to do what I need to do in an audition if I don't really invest in it. But then the, the flip side to that is if I don't get it, I'm, yeah, I'm just like, don't talk to me today. I have yeah. to get tell my family. I have to get myself away from my family and just yeah. go and be furious by myself. And it is it's almost like because yeah. you've really, really poured your heart into it, and it's no one's fault. It's just you know somebody else was more right for it. But yeah. I think I think allowing yourself twenty four hours to feel really fum- fuming is really healthy. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're not acknowledging all that time you put in. Yeah. And it, you know, and all that like the investment. Yeah, and, yeah. And belief in, you know. But yeah, I remember when I got Glinda, I was on the bus in Moswell Hill. Really? <laughs> it was packed, standing up, <laughs> holding on to like a thing, like, yeah. like that. And um, <laughs> it was really surreal. It was really surreal. I got this call from my agent, oh. who I've been with for a billion years, yeah. um, just saying that I got that. I can't quite remember where I was when I got Donna, but you know what? It's because I had just had a baby and I don't really remember an awful lot of the first lot of rehearsals either because Gosh. when i came to do the cast change i was like did we do this last year and they were like yeah I like, wow <laughs> I, I don't remember having this discussion at all <laughs> yeah and, and, and as a working mum diane is it is that tricky to to navigate to balance yeah you know, but you, no, your day's flipped isn't it yeah no more than anything else in yeah. fact of what i would say is that certainly when you've got a small child who's not at school yet, you get your days with them. You not lose that, but you do lose his bedtime. And that is really, that's really hard. But Donna yeah. was quite nice because it was a seven, sh- uh, seven show week, not an eight show week. And you could choose which day you had off. Oh, wow. So, uh, but I was like, actually, if I have Wednesday night off, that means I get to put Hugo to bed one night a week. And it was like a, made the made the week into two little chunks, so that worked really well for me. Yeah. So when Hugo was really little, I did I I did that show right up until when he went to school, and then when he goes to school, then when they go to school, it's a bit harder. But you do get to do this. You get to do the school run in the morning. You get to do the school run um, on the way home, and then you go and do a show. And while again you're missing bedtimes, a lot of parents have to miss school run. Yeah, so yeah, sure. It's, it's like, you know, it's a trade off, whatever you do if you're a working parent, it doesn't matter what industry you work in. And then we've got healthy, healthy uh, unemployment periods where you get to do everything. What do you use then for those periods that are, Dan, a quiet? Do you, do you have a routine? Do you like a little bit of structure? Or do you just sort of take each day as you find it, kind of, you know, mentally? It's changed a lot over the years. Now, my structure becomes around exercise. So. Mm. I every other day go for a run in the morning and do some weights that's a new thing the weights is a new thing because I finally accepted the fact that it is actually really important to do some resistance training <laughs> the child of the night I mean I'm a teenager of the 90s we were told not to do that we were supposed yeah. to look emaciated and sort of um you know what was it heroin chic that's what they yeah, used to call it right, you know right. so heaven forbid you had any muscle tone and <laughs> um, now now I, I understand that that's not the right thing to do so I I think I structure my day and I often write myself a little list of things I'm going to do today, a little schedule yeah, around yeah. cleaning, around doing things. And I try to lay down foundations for when it gets busy. So I think of it as building blocks and keep reminding myself. And, you know, I try to learn. I don't always manage to do it because, again, I forget and you get lazy. I try to learn a different song every so often. Oh, just to okay. keep, Yeah, as if, as if you've got an audition, even if you've not got an audition. Pretend you've got an audition and learn a song. Yeah, oh, that's great. To keep, so just, to, just, just keep to that keep muscle tuned going. in. Yeah, that's... yeah, and you know, it, it doesn't do any harm to keep your rep up to date. And yeah. there's always self tapes, and you've got I to know. treat those like work as well. You know, audition yeah. is work. It's it's just yeah. it's an extension of you. You're just not getting paid for it. You um you work with the lovely Hannah Waddingham Diane on the Beautiful yeah. Game actually. Um, she's she champ she's flying. She champions the graft of theatre yeah. actors, my goodness. And She's really know, she, she, been brilliant. Talk yeah. about holding the door open behind yeah. you. Yeah, it's like, she's, it's massive. I just want to ask you, you've recently been in um, Emmerdale for ITV. 
was that a good experience for you like that was it lovely yeah. to move into tv and that was a big storyline wasn't it yeah it is it's a big ongoing storyline and i was really fortunate to get that it just sort of came out of the blue i actually tested for a different character at the, at the end of last year that didn't go my way but it kind of got close and then they sort of came back with this one I actually was like, this is such a new, it feels like I'm starting over with stuff like that because I haven't done a lot of television. I was really lucky over one of the lockdowns because everyone was free. All of a sudden, there was opportunities that weren't there before. And I got a couple of guests in like one episode of Holby, one episode of, 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 a, of a drama. And that was the first television I'd ever done. And I was like already in my mid forties, and I was just like, "Wow, okay, this is." But because it was a, it was like an appearance on something, you don't really, you don't really find your feet yeah. in that way, especially not as somebody who has not done any television at all and has done theatre my whole life, where I feel at home, I feel comfortable, I know what to do, I know where I am, and what the, the format is. Um, so it was nice to go something like Emmerdale because what they are and known one of the loveliest places to work in in the world of soaps my husband and all the soaps and he loves all of them but he always has a special place in his heart for Emmerdale because they just are so welcoming the people are lovely it's everybody it's just the most beautiful vibe there and from the minute I turned up they made me feel back home special you know this it's, it's a small role it's Jenny she's the nurse I'm there to facilitate a storyline which is not my but I was not made to feel, you know, erroneous. I, I, I was, is that the right word? Extraneous. Well, I was not made to feel out of place in any way. I can't even tell you how nice they were. And I was really honest. I was a bit like, this isn't my normal thing. So if I'm in your way, don't feel that I'm going to be offended by telling me to do something because I'm yeah. not. I will be grateful for you to say just little things that I don't know. Yeah. And treat me like I'm a 22 year old who's just left college and I don't know what I'm doing. Just treat me like that. And they did in a really gentle and loving way. Within two episodes, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm good. Oh, I'm that's fine. I know so where good. I am now. Yeah. Because I felt able to be honest with them. And I think I've ended up doing like nine episodes wow. all together. Yeah, it was the most wonderful opportunity. Lovely. That, that's such a lovely thing that if you can just treat people kindly, nicely, because you don't know where they're coming from, what walk of life they're coming into a new environment. It's so important. Yeah. Just a friendly face, a smile, and it just enhances everybody's working experience exactly. and, and life and, and day. Don't assume. I think we, we all, we're, as human beings, we're terrible. We jump to assumptions about why somebody's doing something. Yeah. And actually, a little tiny little conversation, you go, oh, actually, it's because they're really nervous. So actually, it's because they haven't got a clue what they're doing. <laughs> you know, they've never been here before. And people will make the assumption, me going into that, I know exactly what I'm doing. And I haven't got a clue. Yeah. I haven't got a clue. Why would I? Why would I know all the little minutiae of, of doing, doing an ongoing drama like that? I have no idea what I'm doing. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. And I can't, I couldn't thank them enough, really, for just oh, being that's so, so great. fantastic and supportive and funny. And and <laughs> I was. <laughs> It's so lovely to chat to you, Diane. I love to ask you um, too. all my guests, um, what's on the dinner menu tonight? Have you, are you a cook or does Neil cook? Who's, oh, who's in charge we, of the grub this evening? We take it in turns. I think it's salmon tonight. Oh. And I make a little, um, a little salad with, um, with raw cauliflower, all uh, sort of uh, whisked in a food processor so that it's like, a couscous type of thing. Oh, nice, and nice. And I've got some pomegranate seeds and some lemon juice and some raw courgettes and a little bit of feta in there. Oh. And maybe some pumpkin seeds if I'm feeling really fancy. Oh, my goodness. And that's a little goodness. salad on the side. Nice. And you can make it in bulk and it goes with everything and it's really healthy. I mean, but, yeah, we're all for the salad as well. Yeah. Salad with a bit of seedage, the old seedage. Um, I know, just lovely. Salads very and seeds. Healthy. Salads and seeds. I mean, well, you've known me for a very long time. This is a very different Diane to <laughs> <laughs> to a pint and a kebab Diane uh, on the Beauty and the Beast tour. I know. Two thousand and two. Yeah. We felt well, you, you, your cast took over. I left. I did a year, and then I know I, I, I was replaced. <laughs> no. Um, 
But what fun, what a great show. And I just remember you during the, the takeover and you were so kind and so friendly and it was no, just great to see you again. Oh, but likewise. I, I was I, so excited. What a, what a lovely... Oh, great uh, show. You know, lovely yeah. Stephen Matthews, Drew Varley, Barry James. Gorgeous. What a cast, my goodness. Hey, Diane, I, Diane, I think you should release an album called Salad and Seeds. Sa- yeah, so Salad and Seeds. Diane, That's my band name. <laughs> It's so lovely to see you. Lovely to have a you chat about too. your career and about your role in Emmerdale and Wicked and Mamma Mia. And I hope you all have a lovely day there. And it's just been lovely to see you it's after so as well, long. Isn't it? It's a beautiful gorgeous day. day. I so, hope you have a lovely day too. Thanks, Tyne. Oh. Enjoy that coffee. And it's honestly been so lovely to chat. And thank you for joining me in Benji's Cafe Podcast. Thanks for listening to Benji's Cafe Podcast with the wonderful Diane Pilkington. Make sure you hit follow so every episode gets sent straight to your phone. And if you can, please leave a review. No booking required, available wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget, a new episode every Tuesday. In episode 23, I'll be chatting to the TV presenter, Jay Lusted. I'll get the kettle on. Have a great day. <laughs>